My name's Aaron LeBauer, and I'm a Sagittarius. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, what I have what I hope is a pretty kick-ass talk for you guys today. This is called How to Create Value for Your Patients. So it doesn't matter if you take their insurance or not. Like, it really doesn't matter. So my promise to you today is to show you how to create value in your practice or as a physical therapist working for someone else. So it doesn't matter whether you take insurance or not. Like, that's it. It doesn't matter. The insurance isn't the reason people are coming to see you. And if you're in a cash-based practice, the promise to get reimbursed is not the reason people come to see you. It, and at the end, I have a special announcement and a free gift, so um, pay attention. I have some cool things been happening this week, so this has been a huge week for me. Um, a couple of them have been uh, that I'm here, and this is awesome. The other one is, where's Derek? Derek, raise your hand. Derek, stand up. Okay, <laughs> turn around. Cue the music. <laughs> Okay, Derek, yeah, <laughs> Derek is, uh, the, like, so in July 1st, I will have achieved my one-year goal I set last year is to take two weeks off of my clinic and um, not have to close the clinic, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jerry, and Derek is the, what's gonna, who's going to make that happen for me, so thank you, Derek. Yeah, Derek's put in some hard work the last two weeks. He got licensed in North Carolina at 4.55 p.m. on Thursday before we got on the airline. <laughs> and uh, so um, I'm going to show you why, basically, uh, why it doesn't matter you take, someone takes your insurance and how to make all this happen. So again, you know, tweet this. My, my favorite hashtags are CashPT, and then I'm LeBauerPT. You can throw it up on Instagram, Aaron LeBauer, whatever. But share, share this stuff with your friends in the world because they need to know about it. So as I said, I'm Aaron. I'm a Sagittarius. But I also, I love food. And um, I mean, last night uh, was, we were like hooking it up. So that's the, uh, that's the hibachi, um, raw uh, pork belly and all that good stuff. That was out in Denver. So I started cash-based practice right after PT school. I, I was a massage therapist. I've been a massage therapist since 2009. And when I was in massage therapy school, it was expected that we were going to get out and own our own business. You know, we might work for someone else, but the expectation was that you are going to have a massage therapy practice. And so we did two semesters, Eastern massage, Western massage, and at the end of each was a business course. It was longer than the business course that I got in PT school. And it was more relevant. Uh, so when I got out of school, I knew, okay, I'm charging $85 an hour to do massage therapy. Well, my option here in Greensboro is to work for someone who's going to not want me to practice the way I want to practice, and I'll make $35 to $42 an hour, or I can go to the hospital and make $40-something an hour. And I was like, if I'm going to practice the way I want to practice, I'm not going to take a 50% pay cut. So I've got to, you know, go out and, and just charge $10 more an hour because I just paid $80,000. People are going to pay me $10 more an hour. No one around me other than my family, you know, really believed that that was going to happen. I had a couple CIs that were, you know, like, yeah, you can do this, but it takes, you know, it's going to take a lot to get it there. And, um, but a lot of the PTs I talked to were like, you can't do it. So I started 100% cash-based practice right out of the gate. I had my, I certainly had my reservations, but, uh, I knew inside me that I needed to treat patients the right way. And the only way I could do that was to do it my way, and no one was going to hire me to do it my way. Um, I have, my practice is 100% direct access. And what that means to me is that I don't get any referrals from um, physicians that, uh, that mean that I have to treat patients in a certain way. I do get some referrals from physicians. They're usually, they've been my patients. And then they're still not the best referrals, referrals, because if they uh, refer their family, it's great. If they come themselves, it's great. But when they start sending their patients, there's a different conversation that has to be had. And we'll, you'll definitely know about that by the end of this weekend. I started my cash practice for less than $5,000. So it doesn't take a lot of money to get started. It takes 
um, hard work and time and putting your money into the right place. I mean, there's um, a few places that I would spend money. One of them where I spent the most money was on a high-quality uh, massage table and mentorship. And then the rest is just little pieces here and there. I've had the opportunity to speak at quite a few different events about cash-based physical therapy. CSM, um, I got to do that as a DPT student, which is really awesome. And then um, I love working out, swinging kettlebells, doing yoga. Uh, I, I used to race bicycles, so I raced, as a, um, I raced in Belgium, all over the U.S. I got um, hit by a car in France in a bike race. I hit my head in Iowa and didn't know why I was there. And um, I, I also got the, the best job I've ever had was working as a bike messenger in San Francisco because I got paid $2,600 a month to ride my bike. Right? I mean, my job right now is pretty awesome, but riding your bike all day long, it, that kicks ass. <laughs> so <laughs> um, this is my beautiful wife, Andra, and my 1982 Westphalia, which is also part of my plan um, for being out of, the, out of town for two weeks. This summer, we're going to see my brother in Illinois, go to Wisconsin, and then drive over to the Lambretta Jamboree. The Lam Lambrettas are vintage Italian scooters in the national rallies in Philadelphia. So I was like, how am I going to put all these things together? And this whole thing came together. So um, I'm speaking here. This is the best event of the year. This is my, I mean, that's it should be enough. Smart Success PT Live. Um, I've been at some of these other conferences, um, been featured on podcasts, Advanced Mag, etc. Um, and I've helped, hopefully, I've, I've helped and inspired thousands of PTs to start their practices, whether I know about it or not. And right now I've got a three-week waiting list of cash-paying patients that hopefully Derek is going to help me shrink that. But once we turn on the marketing funnel again, it's going to ex explode. So the, the other cool thing is, is and Greg and I did this at, um, at CSM. It's like, how do you earn $100,000 as a physical therapist? There's a lot of different ways. But most people are like getting out of school with a ton of debt. They're like, I can get a job for $80,000, right? And um, so that's, I, I've found a way to, to do that. So... Um, it doesn't really happen. The Cash PT Nation. We've got over 2,600 members. If you're not in the Cash PT Nation and you're interested in cash-based practice model, not right. You don't have to do it right now, but I want you to pay attention to me. But check out the group. Find us on Facebook. Request to join. Um, and that's uh, and this group has grown um, over the last few years. So think about. I want you guys to think about something real quick. Even close your eyes for a second. Everyone, close your eyes. Okay, pretend like it's quiet in here. Vi imagine yourself with your patients doing like the work that you know is right for them. Like, okay, what is that? Is it some hands-on therapy? Some dry needling? Is it spending quality time with them? What is it that you are like, oh, this, is where, this is my dream practice, my setting. What is that? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Okay, now open your eyes. Now, who here, who here sees that practice in front of them as an opportunity to, uh, to get as an employee? Anyone see that? Like, that can't exist, right? But, but now, who sees it as, like, I have to create that? Right? So sometimes you've got to create, you create that thing. Like That's what I had to do, is I had to create it. Do you think that um, most people have that, have that opportunity to, to get their dream practice? Like, why is that? Is it because you know, it's not there, like a lack of opportunity, or they don't know how? Anyone? Is it because, they, is it because it's not there, or is it because they don't know how? Yeah. I agree. They don't know how to do it. And why is that? Because were we taught how to do that in PT school? Were we taught how to do that anywhere else? Okay. So that's what I hope that you guys are going to get out of some of this today and tomorrow, is that you're going to learn, this is how I'm going to create what I want out of my practice, my career as a PT. So how do we create value? Anybody, know, anybody have like an idea? Like what is valuable? 
Like why? Like like Greg was saying, like the the Apple logo. Like why is a, ni- a pair of Nike shoes valuable? It's because Michael Jordan used to play in them, right? Who here watched Michael Jordan play? Wow. Okay, not on replay. Okay, awesome. Who who here doesn't know who I'm talking about? Okay. God, Jordan was pretty amazing. So I've come up with some uh, my three pillars of creating value. Number one, I can help more patients get better faster, even without insurance, if we listen to our patient's story. Number two, if you touch a patient where they hurt, they know we know where their problem is. And this is a big plus because likely they haven't been touched by anyone else. Anyone seen that, like evaluating a patient, and they're like, oh my gosh, you're the first person who's touched me there. I've had patients come from the orthopedic surgeons, and I'm like, did they test the, your joint? No. I'm like, well, how do we, you know, they haven't been touched. And number three, your patients can regain control of their health, and they won't care if you take their insurance or not. How much is, how much is that worth, you know, to be able to go back to work again, go to the beach with your family again, run a 5K? Okay. The pitfalls of the physician gatekeeper model. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Direct access, like it's direct. You know, it's not even just direct access. It's like I gotta get referrals from physicians. What percentage of your total referrals are from physicians? So who here owns a practice right now? Okay, out of everyone here who owns a practice, anyone have more than fifty percent of their referrals from physicians? Okay, a couple people. What uh, what about more than, more than 80%, okay? So I've been in a room where like more than 80, 75% was like majority of the room, okay? So think about this. What percentage of your patients are referred from like three physicians? Anyone want to, like, do you have like, Jeremy, do you have like three people that refer a majority of your patients? Yeah, okay. What happens if one or more of them retire? start their own physical therapy practice, become employed by the hospital system, or they disagree with your assessment with a patient. Like, what happens? Yeah, that's your income stream. That's like, that's like putting all your eggs in one basket and, with Bernie Madoff, right? You know, you're like, you're like it, it's, and so that, that's a revenue or a potential revenue. The other thing is um, what happens if you, sit down with a patient and they're like, yeah, my doctor says I've got bursitis at the hip. And, you're, and you touch them and they're like, like, no, that's like your piriformis, your glute medius. And you're like, no, this isn't the problem. Or, you know, and they go back to the physician and they're like, oh, my physical therapist says I've got this other thing. And he's like, no. And then they get upset with you for, you know, not going to, uh, not going through the chain of command. You know, I got, I got sent to the principal's office in PT school because I didn't go through the chain of command. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I'll tell you that story later. Um, so just three physicians can be over 50% of your revenue. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've seen that quite a bit. And um, does this, af- wouldn't that, that would affect how you s- your future referrals. I mean, so it, it can affect how I might talk to a patient. You know, if I'm, like, worried that this is going to happen. So, um, are you afraid of upsetting the doc? Like, I hear this. Like, anyone have ever treated a patient and gone, like, okay, if I say this, it might disagree with the referring provider, so I better be careful what I say. Anyone had that experience? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So, is that the best thing for the patient? No. So in a, uh, in a practice where I have a 100% direct access, it doesn't matter what I say to the, I can tell my patients the truth about what I think is happening without worry about my income, without worrying if insurance is going to pay for it or not. You know, I can treat patients the way they need to be treated without worrying that I'm not going to get reimbursed or I'm going to piss someone off. I want to give you guys some numbers. Um, 19 is the number, is the average day to uh, get an appointment with a physician. Let's say someone has back pain. 
wow, ouch, right? I wake up two days in a row, like, oh, this is really bad, or I fell to my knees or whatever, and like, okay, I got to get an appointment with my doc. Well, 19 days is two and a half weeks. That's average. This is national average, okay? Maybe you can go to the emergency room or, you know, wherever, but that kind of stinks, and we know what happens there. So let's say I get my appointment. I got to wait 20-something minutes for them to show up and call my name. And likely is when I go in there, when I call, when I, this is my experience. I, I call on the phone to get an appointment with my primary care. And they're like, hello. And I'm like, how can I help you? And I said, I want to make an appointment with uh, Dr. Rigby. They're like, okay, what's your date of birth? It wasn't like, hey, what's your name? My name's Sally. Not, you know, how can I help you? It was, what's your date of birth? Like, my date of birth was the most important thing. What's your date of birth and what's your insurance? Like, that was the most important Two first two questions. Okay, once I get in to see my physician, I get 13 minutes with them. And this is average, so some people are getting less. Right? So I get 13 minutes to spend with them to tell them about all my problems that are causing my back pain because I woke up one day and it just went out. Or I slipped something. And, you know, it wasn't because I was, you know, I got hit on the football field. It was, I rolled over in bed. So um, the other thing is, is physical therapy is highly underutilized. I think, I don't have the slide, but it's 7% of the people that go see their physicians are getting referred to physical therapy. So not only is there a huge opportunity for us, but with those numbers you just saw, we can win all day long. It doesn't matter if we hate take insurance or not. If we do, we don't. Even if you do take insurance and you see four people an hour, they're getting 15 minutes of your time, which is two minutes longer than they're getting in their physician. And you've got your team for the rest. I mean, their appointment is probably longer than that. So we can win no matter what when we look at these numbers. Most people, oh yeah, here it is. Most people, over 50% with low back pain visit their physician. Of these people, only 7% are referred to physical therapists. The majority of them are given opioids, uh, pain meds, um, meloxicam, don't do anything. Here's a sheet of exercises. Um, it's all in your head. Anyone, anyone, you guys familiar with those statements? Yeah. It's all in your head. 59% of regular opioid users report back pain. I have a patient I'm treating right now who's had, he's got back pain, but he's also had two exploratory ankle surgeries because he had lateral ankle pain. They didn't know why, it didn't go away and they didn't know why. Nothing was wrong on the x-ray or MRI, so let's do some arthroscopic surgery and see what's wrong inside. And he's been on opioids for a long time, and he's having a hard time getting off, and they're treating him like a criminal. I mean, that's not... And now my job is, like, much harder than it should have been. Um, the total medical costs for low back pain are $2,700 more when you get early physical therapy, less than 14 days. Okay, we, we should all be familiar with that number, right? Like, good. I'm good with that. It says, you have so much, is it, you have so much arthritis in your knees, I'm surprised you're still walking. Okay? My pa I, this is a patient. Was, I mean, I got all these quotes. I, I stopped writing them down. It's like, you have, I mean, for, for someone to tell their, in their patient that, it's like, I don't know what they're, they, why they think that's helpful. It not only does it make my job harder, it, it it's like it doesn't help the patient at all. You know, you're you're uh, you have the spine of an 80 year old. You know, I had a patient last week who um, was having some numbness, tingling in his arm, and some loss of strength. And he goes in, and he, the physician reports finally comes back to my office because we had to actually call to get it. They didn't send it to us when the patient asked them, and the the report says his. Um, Wrist strength is fine. His wrist strength, his neck range of motion is fine. His wrist range of motion is fine. And he's got these herniations and, and uh, loss of space. And, he, and they told him to stop doing contact sports. He's 55 years old. He's played lacrosse for 30 years. He plays like semi-contact lacrosse. And they're like, stop playing contact or sports. He didn't have full, he didn't have good strength in his wrist because he can't get it all the way back. The tingling was 
resolved from working on his rotator cuff, and like, I'm like, well, how am I supposed to trust what you're saying when you're telling me the strength in his wrist, is, his hand is fine, when obviously it's not. It's like, it's an incongruent communication. And I think that's why it's important not only that we, with direct access, that we have this mindset of a, pro, like a, a primary care provider, but when I can look at the patient and say, that's not my finding, and I'm seeing this other thing, and I have no, there's no reason that I'm going to worry about the physician getting upset with me. You, you know, it's like, I got to do what's best for that person. What's possible, think about this for a second, what's possible when you can position yourself as an expert in your community? You know, your local community. Like, what's possible for you in your practice or as a physical therapist? So, number one, I can help more patients get better faster, even without insurance, if we just listen to their story. So, one of my, my dad, I'm going to pull this out because I didn't put this in the presentation. My dad is a cardiologist, and um, his mentor, here it is, his mentor is Dr. Eugene Stead. This is this guy who's a physician. He started the phys- physician assistant program at, at Duke University, and my dad just talks about this guy all the time. And one of his quotes, one of Dr. Stead's quotes is, if you listen to the patient long enough, you'll get the diagnosis, right? And that's what we should be doing, is listening to the patients. Their physicians should do that. They, they shouldn't just go, oh, you need an endoscopy before you go see the, um, the uh, gastroenterologist, or you need an MRI before you see the surgeon. We should see the patient watch a move and then say, you know what, this doesn't look right. Let's get you an MRI, because this is kind of weird, you know, when you extend your neck and your whole arm lights up, like, yeah, and it stays that way for a week, yeah, you might need an MRI. Because I had a patient that did that. It was like, she did this, her arm was like, bling, and it didn't go away for like a week. She came back in, I was like, you need to go see someone about that. And she got an MRI, she had a um, cervical myelopathy. I mean, it was very different, and I've, this is the first one I've seen in like 10 years. This is the thing, is this, let me go back to listen. Yeah, we're not going to sell physical therapy for anyone. It's, it's more than that. Because what is physical therapy anyways, right? When we've got uh, people that we're trying to talk to about what we do, it's like no one knows what physical therapy is, but they know, they, they know a lot of other... They know, they know about a lot of other things. Because physical therapy... The, the deductibles, I mean, my, my deductible right now is, uh, my in-network deductible is like $7,000. Is it $7,000? I think it's seven. And I pay 1500 a month for my family of four. My ad, and my out-of-network deductible is 10000 So if I'm going to go see myself, I got to pay the first 10000 But I actually got to pay more because the only thing that counts towards my 10000 is the allowable amount. <laughs> not the 150 I charge, but the $45 allow, dollars that's the allowable amount. So we're not going to get, um, you know, we can't convince patients to come see us for physical therapy because of the promise to get reimbursed because it's never going to happen. So let me go back to like value. Value is the benefits divided by the, the cost. There's an out-of-pocket cost for everything. It's like, what is the benefit we're going to get? The, the value is based on your customer's perception of what they're getting. Not what they're actually getting, but what they perceive they are getting. And you guys are here because you perceive that you're going to get some awesome content. right? It hasn't even been delivered to you. And it could be you know, just me and Greg and Paul just stand up here smiling. Like last night, like the... How many of you, like, got a ton out of the, um, the meet and greet last night? Yeah. There was no content. You get it? There was a lot of content. There was no planned content. There was no structure. It was, it was, it was come here and meet all these awesome people you've been connected with online. And and I was just like, last night, I was like, that's all we got to do. It was like, just get everyone in a room. So it's about because we all have this expectation we're going to come and meet and connect with people. So if I had the expectation I was going to come and be boring and bored and be a troll, you know, then I'd have that experience. But this is all about the benefits to patients versus the features of your practice or your credentials. That's why it doesn't matter 
what stuff I've studied, you know, who I've learned manual therapy from, et cetera, what techniques I do in my clinic. All that's, none of that matters to a patient. So let me get back to listening. This is the main thing you want to find out from people is what their number one thing is. Their number one reason that they're here to see you right now is not physical therapy. Okay? It's what they can't do. It's, it's their, their number one thing. Might, they might not know about it. You know, so let's say they're referred by the physician. Why are you here today? Well, my doctor told me I needed to come see you three times a week for six weeks. A val and treat, or maybe it's more specific than that. You, you got to know, like, in order to get them on board with your home exercise program, you got to find out what's driving them and what's motivating them. People do whatever it takes and pay anything to be able to run a 5K, play with their kids, travel with their family. Go, you know, I can't drive more than five hours without hip pain. I can't drive 30 minutes. I got to drive to work 45 minutes each day. People do whatever it takes to get that. Okay, if you make the conversation about that, then it, okay, let's see. Um, who here has like struggled to perform, you know, like, like go on a vacation, perform a uh, workout or something like that? <coughs> right, me? It's like, at one point, I couldn't ride my bike more than an hour without my neck killing me. I was just like, I couldn't, my neck, I was like, it's like, I was like, I would pay a ton of money to be able to ride my bike for f- my four hours without neck pain, you know. But no one was offering me that, you know. And I was, at that time, I was in San Francisco, and I don't know if, Jerry, you were offering that then either. <laughs> um, so cash-based practice secret number one. You want to ask people, what's going on that you're looking for physical therapy? That's my first question. Or one of my first questions. Like, what's going on? The, the, what's, what's wrong? How can we help you? What's the number one thing you want to get out of our treatments together? Sometimes people say, I can do anything I want. It just hurts. Okay, well, what's, what do you want to be able to do better than you are right now? What's that, what's that thing? What would it look like if I could walk in the back room and flip the switch that has your name on it and you walk out of here without pain? Okay. We got to listen to patients. We have the unique opportunity to, to sit with patients one-on-one and listen to them. Find out what their story is. Because sometimes for them, just telling you your, their story is enough. They, don't have the, they haven't had that opportunity in their physician's, the physician's visit to sit and tell their story because they had 13.3 minutes and the timer was running. And do patients really know what's going on? So we have the opportunity to educate them. I had a patient come in, and he was like, I was told I have stalagmites and stalactites in my spine. And his image of that is these two sharp things coming at each other. They're just going to sever the thing in there, the spinal cord. And he was afraid to move. So if we give them their, our time, then they're going to um, they're gonna get better. Even just feel, people walk out like, I barely touched them. Like, my practice is, my, my physical therapy, my personal practice is hands-on manual therapy. But sometimes people come in, they tell me their story for 20 minutes, I look and watch them move a couple things, I give them something to do at home, and I've barely, I've touched them for five minutes, and I'm like, I feel so much better. It's because I, I listen to them. People are like, I should pay, I need to pay you to listen. I was like, you're, we're good. You know, like, like, you know, they understand, like, they're telling me all this other stuff that's going on in their life, and I'm like, whatever, we're good. So here's a, I'll read this to you or just summarize this and kind of showed up a little small, but so I had a patient, Jim, and he basically went to his family doctor. He got meds, MRI, um, he went back, he got these negative tests, etc. He um, says, spending another Sunday seeking relief, I remember reading an article or post several months ago about Labauer PT. And he, with a little looking the next day, he found us, gave us a call, and he's like, Dr. Bauer answered his own phone. Four treatments, and five weeks later, I feel great. The therapists not only treat you during their therapy session, but they also give you the knowledge to carry on the treatment at home for maintaining a life free of back pain. I mean, this is someone who was given the runaround or given medicine and told, oh, it's, there's nothing to do. There's nothing we can do. I mean, these, my point is, is, from my perspective, it's really frustrating that these dudes and ladies 
don't offer physical therapy as an option. And there's a, there's a systemic problem further away from us where this is the issue that they don't know about it. But, if we, but, but he found us online when he was looking. He found us through our uh, channels. He came in. We talked to him. We helped him moving, and he got better. I mean, it's not the first time. If you touch a patient where they hurt, this is number two, if you touch a patient where they hurt, they know we know exactly where their problem is. We have to meet our patient's affective needs. So they need to know that we know exactly where the pain is. So if, if, you, if, you, if there's one thing that you do during a session, I would say would be to touch them where they hurt. You know, I tell my patients, it's like, you know, I'm going to watch you move and I'm going to touch you. And I want to know, does it worse? Does it get better? Or um, is, there, is there no replication of the symptoms? Because if I can make it hurt worse or make it feel better, then I know I can help you. Um, and they likely haven't been touched by anyone else. So four reasons why physical therapists should touch every patient. We need to meet their affective needs. That's number one. It enhances motor learning. You know, so we can guide their movement. Let's say you're not a manual therapist, you just do exercises. Put your hands on them and guide them because we know there's a lot of people that just doing simple movements, their body just doesn't understand. It's whether it's a part of the pain process or they were born with it or who knows what. We can touch them. And um, the other thing, so my dad has always told me with the, he's like, Dr. Stead do, does this. So it's like even, he's like, he'll put the stethoscope around his neck and this is my dad, this is his mentor, and he's like, he'll just put the stethoscope up on the patient's chest, even he's not even listening, and the patients are like, oh. It's like it gets, it's just that connection makes a big difference for, pe- for people. You know, yes, the evidence shows that we should touch patients. There's good reasons to touch patients, and it feels good, and that's probably my number one, is it feels good. It doesn't have to do anything. If it feels good, and the patients get five, 10, 15 minutes, three hours, two days worth of relief, man, there's no reason they should walk out of your office without being touched. It's better, safer, and much less expensive than surgery. Okay, unfortunate story. I, uh, there was a physician in Greensboro who called me up, and he said, hey, you know, Aaron, I've heard a lot of great things about your patient, from your patients, etc. Let's meet sometime to talk, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, great. I was like, I'm not really interested in, you know, whining and dining you anymore, but I didn't tell him that, but I was like, yeah, that's great, thank you very much. Three months later, he's had back surgery, and he died from his back surgery, you know, and I mean, he didn't, you know, and it's just like, whoa, it's like, you got these, I mean, that's a side effect of surgery. It's, it's crazy. Whatever we do is better than that. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, if it's right or wrong, or you don't have certifications, or etc., There's nothing we do that's going to give people a staph infection um, that's going to make them, you know, like paralyzed or kill them. I mean, there's really nothing. You may be the last person between your patient and unnecessary surgery. Think about that. This is what I was telling um, Sarah, my assistant, a couple days, a couple weeks ago, is we were doing some training and she was, uh, she wasn't quite getting the number one thing from people when they called. I was like, well, she's like, oh, they didn't book. I was like, well, what was her number one thing? She's like, oh, I didn't get it. I said, do you remember that guy with the two exploratory ankle surgeries? I was like, pretend like you're the last person between the, the patient who calls and unnecessary surgery. Because yes, there's a lot of surgery that's necessary, but there's, I see a lot of it that's just not necessary. And is that a lack of opportunity? Or education? Education. So Vincent, here's another one. Um, Basically, Vincent came in. um, He's like, uh, this is great. He said, you told me you thought you could help me, and I made the appointment even though I was still skeptical. After my appointment with you, I was wondering what had just happened. There was a lot of talking and explaining. Then you did a little touching in my neck region and back, and you gave me that ball to take and do some exercises with, but I expected more. You had me make an appointment for a massage with Andra, my wife, um, within a few days, and I left. I went home, applied the techniques, did the exercises, returned a few days later for my deep tissue massage, and wow, after the massage, within a few hours, I felt brand new after having been in excruciating pain for weeks. I only wish I found you sooner, having been out of work for six weeks. I will will be returning for future treatments. I mean, this is a guy out of work. 
he fixes engines at Honda Jet or something like that. I mean, he's just like, he's got to use his body. And he, um, and, and no one was having him go to physical therapy. He's given pain meds, opioids, etc. Come back, do an MRI, etc. He comes in for a massage and he's basically back to work the next day. And I'm not saying this because my massage is the best, although my wife's the best in Greensboro. If you come in, you've got to get one with her. But it's because we can all do that. Okay, number three, you can help your patients regain control of their health and they won't care if you take their insurance or not. The number one thing, no, there's a lot of number one things. The, <laughs> the number three thing that we can do, one of the most important things that you can do is empower your patients to take care of themselves. How many people have seen a patient who's been somewhere else to another physical therapist, chiropractor, etc.? Okay. How many of those people, like, how many of you have seen patients who've been and you said, okay, well, what are you doing? You know, are they having you do anything at home? Is there anything that, uh, that, that you're doing that helps relieve your symptoms? Is anyone seeing patients that have said no to that? Yeah, all the time. Anyone seen them that said yes? Yeah, I've seen a few. They, the no's outweigh the, the yeses tremendously. So, a lot of providers, and whether it's their education or their model, is like there's, the patients don't have anything to do at home. They don't have anything to do on their own. If I'm seeing a patient three days a week in the clinic, you know, they got three days worth of exercise. When I was a student, patients came in three days a week, and you know what, that's necessary if patients don't do anything at home. My model, I see patients once a week, and Here's what you need to do at home on your own. The number one thing I want you to work on this first week is can you reduce your pain and symptoms? If patients can reduce their own pain and symptoms, then um, they've got the power. They're, they've been empowered. They, they now are in control. The, the trouble is, and I don't like to pick, I'm, I'm, like I said in the beginning, I'm an abundant person, but I hear a lot of, um, there, there some professions and like with, with chiropractic adjustments, I'm going to say, I know a lot of chiropractors that are the chiropractic mixers, and I really like them, but the more straight guys who say, only a chiropractor can do an adjustment. Well, the patient can only get an adjustment from the chiropractor. They can't do it at home. I can give my patients a self-manipulation at home that they can do every day of the week if they want to. It's like there's nothing that I'm doing that's proprietary that I can't give to my patients or that I can't give to you guys to give to your patients. And when we do that, then patients are, want to come in and learn more. So, it's, uh, so if we are able to do that, it's amazing. And so you can automate the process. And happy, physician, happy patients and even physicians tell their friends if you ask. And I think I got, yeah, yeah so my empowerment one. So there's the education, okay? There's self-care, self-treatment, pathology. So then you know what? Let's, let me go back and explain to you what's happening. What the, you know, you've been diagnosed with uh, degenerative disc disease. Let me actually explain to you what that process means because patients don't know. Um, pain, you know there's educa- but we can p- educate our patients on pain, on self-care, on, on treatment techniques, on um, you know, everything. We have time to do that because we have 30 minutes, 45 an hour with people. Um, we can teach them to treat themselves. This is cannoli. And that little blue ball right here is, um, I give my, all my patients a ball. So right now they're white. Um, this is, uh, cannoli is the uh, mascot of one of the personal trainers in town who sends me a ton of patients because he came in and I helped him and he was like, oh my gosh, you need to go see Aaron. And it's awesome. So we can teach our patients to use an inflatable ball. I give those away to all my patients. They cost me about two bucks. I put my clinic logo and, you know, a little something on there about their clinic, and it has our, I think it's got our website on it, but it doesn't matter. You just put, like, your logo and your USP on there, and you're good to go. I can teach them foam rollers, corrective exercises. I can teach them, uh, McKen- if, I don't do McKenzie, but I know it's a lot of McKenzie stuff. It's like, okay, can we reduce your symptoms? Okay, good. You know, get, give people the power to make a change in their life. It improves satisfaction, compliance, and outcomes, and People know what to do before calling you again. So one of the things I'll tell people towards the end of our care is, okay, if something crops up somewhere else, I want you to use these same techniques. Use that ball I gave you in that same area. Um, and, and then if you can't get to go away yourself, then give me a call and we'll get you in. So 
I also give patients handouts of like my common home exercises. So I'm also, see, I'm on there, so now I'm the expert, right? I teach them self-treatment techniques. They should be easy to read, descriptions, pictures, and I can automate the education process. All of my patients, when they become a patient, like the, after their evaluation, they get, a, they get a specific series of emails. And this started as things that I wanted to tell my patients, like I was make sure everyone knew about it. So I put it in an email series. So day one, they get a welcome message from me and a link to use that ball I showed you. They get my video on how to use a ball for self-treatment. Um, they get other how-to articles and videos, information from me, like I think is important, general health and wellness. It's a resource for patients. Patients go, I love the emails you've been sending me. You guys got emails from me? Anyone here? Yeah. Same thing, just I'm talking to my patients. And bonus, if you stay on top of their mind with your emails, then you're the patient and they're going to call you again when something else happens. You know, you know, last time it was my knee and now it's my neck. So this is like just the beginning of my sequence. So these are all little action steps. So I use Active Campaign, And when someone gets a tag that says patient, don't worry about how, don't worry about the technical part. It takes them off a welcome sequence. It sends them my email with the, with the ball. And then four days later, it sends them another email message. Three days later, it sends Sarah a message that says, hey, Sarah, check in with the new patient and see how they're doing. And then it says, here's another message like, how to relax with an Epsom salt bath. Um, and it just goes all the way down. One of the most powerful messages I send my patients is six months after they've come in to see me. It's, hey, how you doing? Is there, do you have any questions since our last visit? Dr. LeBauer. And I've sent that out at like six months, nine months, a year, year and a half. And people respond to it and they're like, oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Or, you know what? This other thing's cropped up. Can I get an appointment to see you? I've been meaning to call. And it's, I set it up once, and it keep, for everyone, it's just automated. It's so I've got the education, but I've got automated, you know, marketing built in there. Um, Tori, uh, basically, um, let's see, what she say? Um, basically, she's been to a couple other people with a hip issue. I found the spot in the internal obturator. It relieved her symptoms. Because I, I was talking to her. She thought it was a hamstring strain. Everyone told her it was a hamstring strain. Well, it was a different muscle somewhere else. How did I learn that? By listening to her. And how would she get better? I gave her things to do at home and how to modify her CrossFit workout. So one of the number one questions I ask people on their intake form is, who can we thank for referring you to our practice? 60% of name, name put their friend's name, which is one of my former patients, or me, because they know of me. Even if they've never met me, they'll put my name down because they know me from my emails or from my website. And about 40%, this used to be 50%, answered the internet or Google. Up until about a year ago, it was 50-50. So I've got 30-something Google reviews. They're all five-star reviews. People say, how did you come and see us? Well, I read your reviews online. You're awesome. You're the best. You know, it's the best. I've gone and created myself a, uh, as an expert. And the reason I get that is because that automated email sequence has a message in there some point, a couple points along the road say, hey, you know, we, don't, we don't market to, you know, we don't spend a lot of money on marketing. Would you, the way you can help other people achieve the same result you have is to write a review for us on, um, on Google. So how are you going to create value is to create a patient experience that they can't get anywhere else. And it comes along with a lot of these things. It's listening to them, touching them, and empowering them to make a change in their life. So it's got to be something that they can't find anywhere else, and that comes along with the atmosphere, your comfort culture, like how comfortable they are in the clinic. Now, a lot of people come into my clinic, they're like, oh, this is so nice. There's not a lot of other people here. It's nice and quiet. You know, um, there are some patients that benefit from like a group therapy experience. You know, so I've decided in my practice I want private treatment rooms, and that's the only way we treat is in a private, quiet treatment room with low lighting, nice, comfortable, relaxing music, 
Um, I use like the acoustic guitar channel on Pandora. And Greg Todd music channel. Uh, we do that for our, uh, you know, for our group classes. Yeah, aerobics and stuff like that. So, and you also, you can be accessible. So by phone, email, and text. And patients don't abuse this. You know, um, I, all my emails that go out, people can reply directly to it. I'll reply back. It doesn't take a lot of time. And it's something that they totally did. They're like, oh, Dr. LeBauer answered his own phone. You know, now I don't actually, I don't answer my phone anymore. I have Sarah do it, and she does a better job at it than I do. People come in, and they're like, Sarah, oh, my God. They're like, oh, it's nice to meet you. And they're like, have this, like, they're not even interested in meeting me. You know, they're interested in meeting Sarah and Sarah's experience that she provides. Um, And she does a great job at doing that. Um, And you can give them your time. I mean, just, just like five minutes. Like, you know, if Sarah has, I told Sarah, I was like, you know, if someone, if you can't answer their questions, let them know, and I'll get on the phone with them, and I'll talk to them for five minutes, but usually she can answer all their questions or get them in for an eval. Um, and if you can create a service and experience that provides the highest level of service possible, customer service, like, it's, it's not just about asking the right questions, doing the right things, it's putting it all together, then it doesn't really matter because people are going to the physician's practice or the other practices and they're being asked what's your date of birth what's your insurance sit over here wait over here and they're like when I was at LeBauer PT I didn't get any of that you know I got I got in right away I got to see Dr. LeBauer right away Um, makes a big difference so here's another one of my patients Um, she was told by her orthopedic surgeon to basically stop doing yoga yoga was important in her life and she posted it on. She's like, I got wheel. I mean, she didn't have all the thoracic extension and shoulder flexion she needs, but she got it, you know. And he, he, she said, he, he was, Dr. Wainer was, I mean, she called out her physician on the testimonial. Dr. Wainer, one day, I went to see him. And she says, uh, I almost cried the first time I did wheel. She's like, I went to see Dr. Wainer. He was ready to do surgery on my left shoulder after having operated on my right before I started yoga and met Aaron. Thank you very much. And it's just... Is you can do a lot for patients, you know, in a short amount of time. So some of my final thoughts, go above and beyond and exceed expectations. So part of this is about giving. So give more than you expect to receive in return and give without expecting to receive anything in return and like blow, blow them away. Okay. So people, part of that is you can call me and I'll give you some time or you want my free book on back pain. My book on back pain will tell you what, to, what you need to do. Most people need help. Um, you over-deliver. You, know, you give them an excellent experience, an excellent uh, treatment, you know, your time, you know, more than they expect. If people come in, they don't expect to talk to me. They don't expect to uh, like not wait more than two minutes. They don't expect to get... you know. A 45, you know, they're not getting a 45-minute, hour-long treatment anywhere else. Um, you give them information and a time and an experience they never expected, and you're going to win. What's possible when you can create a high-value experience for your patients? What's possible for them? What's possible for you? So, I just launched my, my podcast right? This took, I started working on it in November, and we launched on Wednesday, and it goes out, and it's like, iTunes is like, your podcast is going to be waiting for a review, and I'm like, oh, really? So then it came out on, th- it, it, it took 40 hours for iTunes to, um, to approve the podcast, but it's on iTunes right now, the Cash PT Lunch Hour, and so I want to invite all of you guys to check it out, um, Jerry, Greg, and Paul are all on here. They're not on the first three episodes, but they're in, they're in queue. I've got 27 episodes ready to come out. If you guys go, and I would really appreciate if you find any value from what I'm do, talking about you today, check out my podcast, subscribe, download it, and um, I would love it if you could leave me a review, um, a five-star rating or whatever star rating you want, but um, if you guys do find value from what I'm talking about on the podcast here today, 
If you send me a screenshot of your review, I'll give you a free 30 days to my mastermind group. And my online mastermind group is where I do live monthly mastermind classes, office hours. You connect with other people who are already doing cash-based PT, people who are growing their cash-based practice. Uh, so all you got to do is um, send me a message, shoot me a screenshot on any social media or by email and say, hey, Aaron, here it is, and I'll get you in, the, I'll get you in my mastermind group. And the first two episodes are brand new. So if you've been to any of my um, live Cash PT Lunch Hour recordings, the first two episodes, 00 and 001, they're brand new recorded. And then um, the next one, we start with some interviews, Q&As, and, and everything goes down the road. So like I said, podcast, SSPT Live, and a new employee this week. Yeah, it's like, my life, I'm good. I'm good. I can go home right now.